Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Hakus, and I have the privilege of serving as one of the elders here at Bridgepoint Church. Uh, our senior pastor, Pastor Craig, is preaching at a church down in North Carolina this morning for a friend. So please be in prayer for Pastor Craig that God would be able to use him in a mighty way to uh, meet the needs of the folks there. Uh, in the meantime, I'm thankful for this opportunity to be with you all and, and share some truths from, from God's Word. Uh, if you were here with us last week, or if you watched online, you know that Matt shared with us some important truths about donuts. Um, I would like to share with you about an even more important part of a nutritious breakfast, which is coffee. All right? Yeah, I'm a big coffee fan. Where are my coffee drinkers at? There we go. How many people are actually drinking coffee right now? I see a few mugs up in the air. Man, I am so jealous right now. Can I tell you? I wanted to bring a cup of coffee up here with me, and I was afraid that I would, like, trip and spill it or something, and then Craig would come home and find a big coffee stain on the nice new carpet. So I figured that probably wasn't such a good idea. So uh, while you all are enjoying your coffee, just drink a few sips for me, okay? Um, now, I know that not everybody in the room likes coffee. There are some non-coffee people out there. But I bet even if you don't drink coffee, I bet you still know a fair bit about coffee. And I'm going to prove that to you here. So, so this is the uh, audience participation part of the message. So I'd like you all to finish this statement for me. Okay, are you ready? America runs on Dunkin'. Good job. Good job. And you all got it right. It's not Dunkin' Donuts anymore. It's just Dunkin', right? Okay, so good. All right, you're all going good. All right, let's move back. It's just a little bit older here, right? The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. Awesome. You guys are doing so well. This is great. You have, you've obviously been drinking some coffee this morning. All right, next one. If you want to pay $5 for a cup of coffee, go to Starbucks. Okay, so that's not a real slogan. I made that one up, but that doesn't mean it's not true. All right? Okay, last one. Last one. If you drink Maxwell House coffee, you know that it is good to the last job. last job. That's excellent. I'm so glad you all got that, especially since it's written in large letters on the screen up here. That's very good that you all got that. Good to the last drop. It's an, it's an excellent campaign uh, advertising slogan for a cup of coffee, right? Because what they're implying by that is that when you drink this coffee, the very last cup, the last few drops you drink of it, are going to be just as good as the first one. Now, if you buy your coffee, or if you're a regular K-cup user, that might not make a lot of sense to you. But if you brew a pot of coffee, you probably know what they're getting at, right? The, the, a brewed pot of coffee, the last cup out of that pot, sometimes isn't very good, is it? It, it might be kind of lukewarm, which nobody likes lukewarm coffee. It might have a bit of a burnt flavor to it. Or worst of all, it may have some floaters, right? Some of, the, some of the grounds that kind of percolate through the filter and kind of settle down at the bottom, and, and that's just disgusting, right? But, but this notion that, that the cup is good to the very last drop is implying that's not true of their particular brand of coffee. Now, we could debate whether or not Maxwell House coffee really is good to the last drop. We could probably even debate whether or not Maxwell House coffee is good, period, um, but we're not going to do that. But what we can't debate is that we serve a God who is good. And we're going to look at a passage of Scripture this morning that emphasizes that our God is indeed good right down to the very last drop. So would you bother me while we pray over this, uh, this passage we're going to look at today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time here this morning. We thank you that you brought all of us together. We thank you for your word and the truth that is in it. Uh, we pray for Pastor Craig this morning. We pray that you would bless him and the people he is ministering to and bring him home safely to us and just meet our needs here in this time that you would open our eyes, open our hearts so that we can see what you would have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we're going to be in the book of 1 Kings today, 1 Kings chapter 17, and we are going to start with verse 1. 1 Kings 17, verse 1. Now, Elijah the Tishbite who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, except by my word. 
Elijah was a mighty prophet of God. And as you read through his life story, he has one of the most remarkable stories of pretty much anybody in scripture other than Jesus himself. And he bursts onto the scene here in 1 Kings 17 almost out of nowhere. And the passage tells us that he's a Tishbite, which means that he came from the town of Tishbe. Now, Tishbe was a town so small that biblical scholars don't even know where it really was. Um, it's in the region of Gilead, but the actual town itself, they can't find it. So if you thought that growing up in Temperance or Ida or Monroe was small, try being from Tishba. But that's where Elijah comes from. And we get no record in scriptures that Elijah toiled away in the minor leagues before finally getting called up to the show, right? He is brought front and center with King Ahab for his first assignment from God. Now, King Ahab is a very uh, interesting fellow. Uh, the Bible says of him in 1 Kings 21, 25, surely there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, incited him. He acted very abominably in following idols. Ahab was one of the most evil kings Israel had ever known. The scripture literally calls him abominable Ahab. And his wife Jezebel was a real peach too. And so this is the audience that Elijah is sent to speak to. And he goes to them and he pronounces judgment on them for their idolatry, for their wickedness, for failing to follow the word of the Lord. And you can imagine how this was received by Ahab to have someone come to him and say, because you're so evil, God is going to send a drought. There's not going to be rain. There's not even going to be dew for several years until God says so. Now, if you're living in an agrarian society, that's a big deal, right? That means famine. That means desolation of your country. And so Ahab, rather than doing the wise thing, which would have been to repent and turn back to God, decides, well, if I can just eliminate Elijah, the messenger, things should be okay. And so because of this, Elijah finds himself on the run from King Ahab. And God provides for him. And God moves in his life to meet some very important needs. So let's look at what happens in verse 2. The word of the Lord came to him, meaning Elijah, saying, Go away from here and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. So God miraculously provides for Elijah's needs. He provides him shelter and safety from the threats of King Ahab, but he also provides for his, his daily needs of, of food and water. He, he sets him besides a, a brook with fresh, clean water, and, and the ravens are literally coming to him, dropping off bread and meat for him to eat. Now, isn't it amazing that even though God at this point in time is, is dealing with one of the most wicked kings in the history of Israel and trying to um, deal with the idolatry and the, the people of, his, of Israel turning away from him, he's still concerned about the day-to-day -day needs of his servant Elijah. See, God... God is very clear over and over in Scripture that, that he is a good God, that he knows what we need, and that he is going to provide for our needs. And Jesus emphasized this in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 31 and 32. He says, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Isn't that amazing? The God of the universe, the God who created everything that we can see, knows what we need each day, that he knows that we need food and clothing and shelter. And even more, the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 4.19, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So we serve a God who knows what we need and has promised to meet those needs which is why that makes what happens in verse 7 very interesting. 
Look at verse 7. It happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Now, this doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? I mean, from a natural standpoint, it does, right? There's no rain, so bodies of water like brooks and streams and rivers are probably going to dry up because there's no water. But from a supernatural standpoint, it makes no sense. This is the God who once commanded Moses to strike a rock with a stick and water flowed out of it. This is a God who, a few chapters later in 1 Kings 19, will send angels to Elijah to provide him with food and water. So why does the brook dry up? And, and why does this make, lead to God changing the plan for how he's going to meet Elijah's needs? Well, I think it's important to recognize that when we look at that verse in Philippians 4.19, when it says, and my God shall supply all your needs, there's no parenthesis there that says he's going to do it the same way every time or he's going to do it the way that we expect him to do it. God doesn't promise that it's going to happen just like we want it to or when we want it to. And I think we oftentimes get ourselves in trouble when we start to assume that we know how God is going to work in our lives. Maybe we look back and say, oh, you remember that time when we had some financial difficulties and we prayed about it and, and God provided the, the promotion at work or the new job that paid more? Well, I'm sure that's what he's going to do this time around when we have more financial struggles. Or maybe there's a time in your life when you were sick and you prayed and you prayed and prayed and God healed you. Well, that doesn't mean that if you get sick again, you're not going to have to go to the doctor. God doesn't promise to meet our needs the same way every time, but he does promise to meet our needs. And so here we find Elijah down to the last drop of water from the brook, but God was still good, and God had a new plan for him. Let's look at verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So here's God's new plan for Elijah, and this plan is crazy, all right? And let me tell you why it's crazy. First of all, the brook at Cherith is about 100 miles away from Zarephath, which means that Elijah's got to walk 100 miles through the desert, no less, to get to this new town that God is sending him to. And oh, by the way, Zarephath just happens to be the hometown of a woman named Jezebel, who we've already kind of talked about earlier here. And it, that region was generally considered the center of Baal worship in the whole nation. So God is not only sending him a great distance away, but he's sending him into the heart of enemy territory. And he's not going there to meet a, a rich noble or a wealthy land baron or somebody with significant means. He's sending him there to meet with a widow woman. Doesn't that sound crazy? If I'm Elijah and I'm sitting there by the brook eating from, from the Raven Deli, I'm thinking, well, why can't I just stay here? Why can't you just do one of those other things you do and get me water that way? But God doesn't, and I think there's some reasons for that. Let's look at how his plan unfolds, starting at verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Then Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go, do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward, you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. So here God does a, another miraculous work to provide 
for the needs of Elijah. So what was different about this plan? Well, I think first and foremost, I think God had something he wanted to teach Elijah. Remember we said that this is the very beginning of Elijah's prophetic ministry for the Lord? He had many, many great battles in store for Elijah. God was going to do miraculous and marvelous things through him in the remaining time of his service on earth. And so God was looking to prepare him, to mold him, to shape him for some of the things he was going to need to do later. And he starts here by asking Elijah to do one of the most difficult things that any of us can be asked to do, and that's to ask somebody else for help. Did you notice that when he arrives at the gates of the city, the widow wasn't looking for him? She didn't come up to him and say, oh, you must be the, the prophet of God that I was looking for. Come on in. I've got, I've got dinner all ready for you. Come on in. Let's, let's, let's stay here with me. She's going about her business picking up sticks, and Elijah has to go to her and say, will you please bring me a glass of water? Will you get me something to eat? Isn't it amazing how sometimes we are much more content to sit by the brook and rely on God to provide for us than we are to walk across the street and ask our neighbor to help us? I think sometimes we are so, so crippled by our own pride that we don't want to reach out to somebody and admit that we need help. We don't want them to see what we perceive as a, as a weakness or a shortcoming in our own lives. Sometimes we, we, we think that, you know, and somehow admitting that makes us, makes us look like we're, like we're not important, like we're not Christian enough to admit that we've, we've got struggles. Um, we don't want anybody else to think that, that we're having trouble at work or having trouble with our kids. It's hard to be vulnerable with people like that. It's hard to be humble enough to approach somebody else and ask them for their assistance. Maybe sometimes we even think, well, they've got enough problems of their own. I don't want to bother them with my problems. I'm just going to be a burden to them. We come up with lots of excuses, don't we, for why we shouldn't ask people to help. But I think God was showing Elijah here how important that is, that Elijah was not going to be able to complete the work God had given him without some helpers in his life starting with this woman. Later in his life, he would rely on men like Obadiah and Elisha to help him complete the ministry of God. We need to learn to be able to ask for help. It's an important point that God wanted Elijah to know. The second thing I think God wanted Elijah to see is that he really needed more than just food and water. That God knew what Elijah needed even if Elijah didn't recognize it. Look again at verse 15. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. Elijah had a pretty good gig going at the brook of Cherith, didn't he? He had shelter, he had water, he had the world's first recorded version of DoorDash, bringing a moot every day. Um, but what didn't he have? He didn't have any people with him. He didn't have any company. He was all alone. Now, certainly he had... God to pray to and, and, and minister to him as well, but, but there were no people there. And, and one of the blessings that God gives him through this experience is the opportunity to, to eat and fellowship with this woman and her son over many, many days. You see, God didn't create us to be all alone. He didn't create us to live in isolation. He created us for community. As early as Genesis 2, verse 18, God had said, it is not good that man should be alone. And in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, it says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. God knows this life is tough. And living in fellowship with other Christian believers is so important. You know, I don't know if, if you all noticed as you were walking in earlier, but we had a bunch of slides up here with some faces of people that lead small groups here at our church or people that lead different ministries. And, and the reason we put those up there is because we recognize that, that while it's, it's really great to come to church on Sunday mornings or, or to Zoom the meetings from home or on your TV or whatever you're doing virtually, but, but being together with other believers is, is critical. 
And, and that's why we try to create a lot of opportunities for people to find ways to connect with the brothers and sisters that are sitting here right now today. And, and if you've never taken advantage of those opportunities, if you haven't reached out to try to join in on a small group or, or join a ministry that you could be involved with and, and serve alongside some other, some other believers, I would really encourage you to do that. Because, because there's just so much more that you get when you're working in community with other believers. You know, several years ago, when, when my wife and I first came to Bridgepoint and, and we got involved with a small group, uh, we were having a discussion with all the members of the group and trying to decide, well, what do we want to call ourselves? What should our group name be? And, and the name that was decided upon was Doing Life Together, because we felt like that really represented what we were there for. We were there to, to recognize that all of us are facing struggles. We're all facing trials. And, and isn't it so much nicer to know that, that other people are, are having, having troubles? Uh, maybe it's financial, maybe it's, maybe it's spiritual, maybe it's their marriage, maybe it's their kids, who knows? But, but to be able to go through that together with other people who, who love you and encourage you and will support you through all that makes, makes a huge difference. God didn't create us to live in isolation. He wanted us to be in community and in fellowship with one another. And he was teaching that to Elijah, and he provided that to Elijah through this woman and her son. But I think the other reason that, that this new plan took shape is maybe not so much about Elijah. The other part of this story is someone we, we haven't talked about the woman a whole lot, but, but there's a lot that we don't know about her. We don't know her name. We, we don't know how old she is. We don't know what happened to her husband. We can assume she had one because it says she's a widow, so he must have passed away. Uh, we know she has a son who was probably quite young, or else he could have been out helping work and support the family and, and get some food for them. Uh, we know she doesn't have very much. She specifically says that she was down to her last handful of flour in a bowl and a little bit of oil in a jar. She's understandably very depressed and discouraged, did you notice what she was doing when she came to the gates of the city? She was gathering sticks to go home and make her last meal and then wait to die. She didn't come to the gates to beg for food. She didn't come to the gates to ask for somebody else to help her or for somebody else to pray for her. She's already resigned herself to the fact that this is it for her and her son. And, and she's quite fearful of this because Elijah tells her when he meets her, don't be afraid. Now, but I want to consider one thing here about this, about this woman. Do you suppose she woke up that morning and was surprised to find that she only had a little bit of flour and oil left? Do you think that came as a surprise to her? If, if you're the one in your household who does most of the cooking and grocery shopping, my guess is that you have a pretty good mental stock of what's in your cupboards. Right? You have an idea how much food is there, how quickly you're going to run out of it, and at what point you might need more. I know my wife will frequently say things to me like, oh, I need to go shopping today because we're almost out of milk. And I'll look in the refrigerator and say, what are you talking about? We've got a half gallon left. And she'll say, no, 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 no. I know how much milk the kids drink. I know how quickly we go through that. It's going to be gone soon, and so we better go get some more. Right? Well, I'm guessing it's the same for this woman. As being responsible for her and her son, she probably knew exactly how much she had. And my guess is that for several days, she had noticed that, that things were getting tight. Things were starting to get a little bit low. And she's going to need some help here. Think about what we said where Elijah was coming from. Remember how far we said it was from Cherith to Zarephath? About 100 miles? How long do you think it took him to walk 100 miles? I did a quick Google search to ask, how far can a person walk in a day? And it said that a fit person in good conditions can probably walk 20 to 30 miles in a day. We can assume that Elijah was probably pretty fit. I'm guessing God was sending him very nutritious meals from the ravens, so he's probably in pretty good shape. But I doubt that crossing the desert uh, was, qualifies as, as good conditions. I doubt Elijah had the latest brand of Nike running shoes. So let's assume it took Elijah, he could do 20 miles in a day, all right? That still takes him about five days to get to the woman. Five days. So 
think about that, that probably right about the time that the woman was starting to recognize that things were going to get a little bit low, God had already started a plan to bring her the help that she was going to need. And it just so happens that on the very last day, her very final supply of flour and oil, that Elijah shows up. What a coincidence. Isn't it amazing the way that God was working to meet the needs, even before maybe she recognized it in ways that she never would have guessed? She didn't know who Elijah was, but help was already on the way because God, in his infinite wisdom, had his plan worked out. So Elijah shows up and provides with her a remarkable promise in verse 14. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. Scripture tells us the drought lasted about three and a half years. We don't know how long Elijah was at the brook of Cherith before he came to live with the woman, but for the sake of argument, what if we assume it's half? Okay? That means he still spent almost two years with this woman where God was providing for her needs every day. Now, I want to be clear about something here. This promise that God makes in verse 14 is what we refer to as a direct or a personal promise. Okay, I don't want, I don't want anybody going home today saying, well, we read in the Bible today that, that the flour and oil aren't going to run out, so we don't have to go grocery shopping anymore, right? This, this isn't one of the promises of God that we all can claim. All right, this was directly for the woman at this specific time. But she still steps out on faith and, and believes it. She trusts that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. Let's look at verse 15. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. And the bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. What amazing faith. She didn't know Elijah. She may not have even believed in his God. Did you notice that when she first meets him, she says, by the Lord your God? It wasn't the Lord my God, the Lord our God, it was your God. But yet Elijah gave her this promise, and in faith she stepped out and was willing to give what she had because that's what she was commanded to do. That's what God had asked her to do. Now, I don't think that the next morning, God had the Amazon truck back up to her front porch and dumped two years' worth of flour up there, right? It doesn't indicate that it was a blessing that all came at one time. It was day by day. It was the flour and the oil pretty much staying the same each day, so she had enough for that day. So can you imagine what that must look like? Every evening, she goes to the pantry, and she looks and says, well... It's the same amount of flour that we had yesterday, same amount of oil as we had yesterday. And I think that would lead her to two possible conclusions. She could look at that and say, you know what? God provided for me today. God provided for me yesterday. He promised he's going to provide for me until the drought is over, so I believe that we're going to have enough for tomorrow. Or she could look at that same amount of flour and oil and say, Boy, it's not very much. And I know that God provided for me today and yesterday, but I don't know. Is it going to be there tomorrow? I know, I know he said it would be there tomorrow, but are you sure it's going to be there tomorrow? I mean, what if I wake up tomorrow and it's not? What are we going to do then? Isn't it so easy to worry about what might happen, about what might come to us tomorrow, about what needs we might have in the future? Well, God knows that we are creatures that worry. And he tried very hard to convince us not to. Um, when Jesus was, was speaking to his disciples in Matthew 6, verse 11, trying to teach them how to pray, he says, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, give us what we need today to meet the needs for today. And, and a few verses later, he says in verse Matthew 6, 34, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see, God wants us to think about how he's going to provide for us today. He's going to worry about what's happening tomorrow. He's promised to provide for us tomorrow. How much time and energy do we waste in worry 
and anxiety and thinking about if God's going to remain faithful to his plan or not. Well, the woman here, she trusted God, and God blessed her for it. She was literally down to her last drop of oil, but God was still good to her. And so she and Elijah and her son, they had miraculous meals day after day after day, and they all lived happily ever after. Until we get to verse 17. So look at verse 17. Now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, what do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. So this amazing, remarkable woman of faith who was so generous to give her last bits of, of flour and oil to Elijah now finds a tragedy in her home. Her son gets sick and dies. And, 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 and she's, she's taken aback. Well, why would this have happened when I was obedient and I did what God wanted me to do? And, and, and look what she does. She, she does two things. She, she blames Elijah, and, and she specifically blames Elijah because of the things in her past. This must be your fault because of something I did before as to why this happened. And that's just like us, isn't it? Aren't we quick to find somebody to blame or, or to think that this is you know, somehow God punishing us for something we did in the past? Well, look how Elijah responds to her. Verse 19, he said to her, give me your son. Then he took him from her bosom and carried him up to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. He called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son is alive. So we see here the first recorded incidents of the resurrection of the dead in all of human history. And, and I just wonder if this child's illness was a surprise to God. Do you think God was surprised by that? I mean, this, child's, this woman's child dies, and Elijah just happens to be there to bring him back from the dead. What a coincidence. You see, I think that just like God knew that Elijah needed more than food and water, I think he knew this woman needed more than food and water. I think he knew that this sickness was on its way. And he specifically put Elijah in her household at that exact time so that when the child died, he was there to rescue him. Now look again at how Elijah brings this about. He goes and he prays, and then verse 21 says, Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray you, let this child's life return to him. Is there anything familiar about that passage? You know, we just celebrated Easter two weeks ago, the, the most famous resurrection in all of history. And it's summarized very nicely in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures, and that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The woman's child died. Elijah laid his body down on him three times, and God brought him back from the dead. Jesus died on the cross, laid his body down in the tomb for three days, and God brought him back from the dead. What a coincidence. You see, I think God is using this episode in Elijah's history as foreshadowing of his ultimate plan for human redemption. He knows that mankind's greatest needs is ultimately a savior for their sinful nature. And, and just like the widow woman thought what she really needed was food and flour and oil, 
God knew that what she really needed was someone to be there to save her son from his physical illness and his death. Fast forward a few hundred years, and the nation of Israel thought what they needed was a king to come and save them from the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. But God knew what they really needed was a savior. What they really needed was someone there to save them from their spiritual death. And then God demonstrated his love for them and for all of us by sending Jesus to be that ultimate sacrifice, to be that savior. He met the greatest need that any of us will ever have, the need for forgiveness of our sins. He showed us just how good he is right down to the last drop of blood from Jesus. Now, there's there's one last point that I don't want you to miss because the woman in the story almost missed it. Look at verse 24. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. You see what she said there? Now I know. She said, now I know. Think about this. How many miraculous meals had she shared with Elijah up to this point? How many hours do you think they spent talking where Elijah would have shared with her the goodness of God and the way that God had provided for the nation of Israel and all the things that God had taught him up to this point? But yet it's not until she looks upon her resurrected son that she can say, now I know. Now I know. It's as if this moment, this this time where she sees her son alive who once was dead, that she finally has her eyes open and she realizes that it was God that was behind it all along. And and at first glance, I think it's easy for us to criticize and think, "Well, well, that's silly. How could you have missed all that? But isn't it true in our lives too? Don't we live under God's miraculous provision for our lives day after day after day? Do you have your health? Do you have food to last you through the day? Do you have a place to stay? Do you have friends and family that love you and and support you? These are all gifts that God has given to meet our needs day after day. And yet it's only when we're able to look upon the resurrected body of Jesus, that we can recognize the goodness of God and that he is the one who has been protecting and providing us all along. You see, Elijah was down to the last drop of water at the brook, and God was still good. The woman was down to her last drop of oil, and God was still good. And God demonstrated his love and goodness to us right down to the last drop of blood shed by Jesus. May we always remember that we serve a God who is good and who meets our needs, even the ones that we don't know about. And he does it in ways that we don't understand, that we don't anticipate. And ultimately, he has provided for the greatest need that we would ever have, the need for a savior to forgive us of our sins. May we always be thankful for that. And if you're here today and you haven't entered into that relationship with God, you haven't looked upon the resurrected body of Jesus Christ to look to him to confess your sins and ask for forgiveness, I hope you'll consider doing that today. I hope you won't leave here today without finding me or or one of the other faces on the screen to ask them about what that means. My hope is that you too could be able to leave here today and like the woman say, now I know. Will you pray with me? The singer Jeff Moore once wrote these words, The God of the past is still God today. So tell me again of the old, old stories. Tell me again of the faithful who walked in the lion's den and the fiery furnace, of Noah and rainbows and donkeys that talked. I don't want to forget, so please tell me again. Tell me again of the gospel story. Tell me again how the whole world was lost, how the only begotten, with grace so amazing, gave up his life on an old rugged cross. I don't want to forget, so please tell me again. Father God, we thank you for this morning. 
We thank you for your word and the truth that it contains. We thank you, God, that you are good and you've promised to meet our needs. Lord, we thank you that you meet our needs that we don't even know about, that we meet, you meet our needs in ways that we could never understand or anticipate. And we thank you, Lord, that you met our ultimate need for a Savior by giving us Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today who does not know you, does not know your Son as their Savior, that they would not leave here without considering that and making that declaration. Lord, we just thank you for who you are, for your goodness and your love. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.